Hello my lovelies and welcome back to another episode of Primed for Crime. I am your host Liv and I'm very excited to have you here and hope you enjoy today's case. I'm finally back you guys, it feels amazing. Um, sorry if it took a little bit longer than expected, there was some not complications like I'm okay don't worry um but yeah I won't bore you with all this and sorry for no episode yesterday I sat down to record for the first time in like a few weeks and recorded loads of content and then my computer just decided it did not want to work anymore um screen went blank everything just gone um nothing had been backed up and I tried to the equipment I use I use like um I'm not really going to buy you, but an audio interface just to make things sound a bit better and phantom power, all that rubbish. And um, yeah, it wouldn't work with my laptop. So I've had to, I mean, luckily Amazon next day delivery managed to get another one. Um, so I'm currently recording this on my laptop. So we'll see how it goes. Hopefully it won't explode. Um, but it's it sounds okay. I think we're okay. And you probably will notice there will be a different um, intro music. Um, all my intro music, my background music is all on my computer and I cannot get it onto my laptop. So I'm having to use just something else for the time being and if we like it, maybe we'll keep it. I'm not sure. And yeah, so I'm going to stop waffling about my very boring life and we're going to get on to today's case. So today's case I actually found on Unsolved Mysteries, one of the older ones. Um, I watched a lot of it whilst I've been off and it was just so bizarre. I just felt like I had to bring it to you guys. You might already know it, you might have already watched it, but some of you may not and that's okay. So today's case is about two women who both shared the same name, Mary Morris, and they were murdered within just a few days of each other. Now, this could just be a crazy coincidence, or it could be something a bit more sinister, but I'll let you decide that for yourself. So before we get into the case today, I just want to state that everything I talk about today is just information I have found online, and I mean no disrespect to anybody involved or mentioned. So... For the first time in a long time, let's begin. This is the murders of Mary Morris and Mary Morris. On the early morning of October 12, 2000 in Houston, Texas, 48-year-old bank loan officer Mary Lou Morris said goodbye to her husband, Jay, as she left for work, just as normal. However, by early afternoon, he started to worry as he had tried to call her several times, but the calls were going unanswered or not being returned, which, again, was unusual for Mary. So this is when he decided to call her supervisor at work and kind of see if she's okay, maybe there's a reason she's not answering a phone. But when he spoke to her supervisor, he found out that she wasn't actually at work and she hadn't been all day. She never turned up. So obviously this is when he knew something was wrong. This wasn't like her. Where is Mary? Meanwhile, about three miles east of the Morris home, a passerby made a horrifying discovery. So whilst walking, he came across the smouldering remains of a car with a body inside that was burned beyond recognition. So obviously police were notified straight away and crime scene investigators were soon like just looking around the scene for any evidence, anything they could find. And by that time, Jay had begun to think the worst. So when he heard from a friend about this burning car near the interstate, he immediately picked up his stepdaughter, Marilyn, and drove straight to the scene. However, like you can imagine, when he got there, the police had already blocked everything off, he couldn't get through, and this police officer basically said, you know, you can't come through, you just go home, nothing to see here. So they did, which was frustrating to them, but you know, at this point, they still don't know if it is Mary, it could be completely unrelated, but what they do know is that Mary is still missing and they don't know where she is. 
However, within just a few hours, detectives delivered the terrible news that, well, they were hoping not to hear. They had identified the victim as Mary Morris, and the crime scene was so brutal that the police didn't think that um, a robbery was the motive. Um, they weren't sure that it was. This usually doesn't happen with robberies. It's very, very strange, and if it was, you know, why would they burn the car with somebody inside? Anyway, so they didn't think that that was a motive, but soon, like, every other route they went down, like, every possible reason as to why just ended up as a dead end. So this is when investigators started looking into Mary's life a little bit more. They were asking her family about, you know, her lifestyle. Did she gamble? Did she drink a lot? You know, any addictions? Did she have any grudges with anybody? But there was literally no reason, like, why she would have been killed. She was a good person who was loved by everybody. She never did anything wrong. She'd never broken the law, never got in trouble. So police were just really, really stumped as to what to do next. Just three days after Mary's body was discovered, this case took a strange twist and if the police were already confused, then they were about to be even more confused. So, not far from where Mary's body was found, another woman had been brutally murdered and just like Mary Lou, she had been found in her car. Now, the most unusual fact about this is that, incredibly, they had the exact same name, Mary Morris. So now there's two women, both named Mary Morris, both found murdered in their cars in the same sort of area within just a few days apart. And I will say, they do strike a very similar resemblance, like they do look very similar. Um, like they've kind of got the same sort of hair, same sort of age. Um, you like, they could Google pictures if, if you want to and just have a look, like it is striking. Um, so this just seemed impossible to investigators, but they did start to try and kind of fit this puzzle together and just try and find out why this had happened to these two lovely women. So the second victim, Mary McGuinness Morris, was 39 years old when the first Mary was killed. And like Mary Lou Morris, she too was a successful professional with a good kind nature. Her friends and family described her as an angel, just full of joy, always happy, making people laugh. And it's no surprise that Mary was a nurse her good nature led her down that path. She was a brilliant nurse practitioner in charge of several clinics for a major industrial corporation. And she was very dedicated to her job and she excelled in every aspect of it. You know, she would happily work 14 hour days, she'd work on weekends, she'd come in if she was needed, you know, any time. She was so reliable. So it's no doubt that Mary got along with all of her staff, as you can imagine, However, there was one new employee, a male nurse, who didn't really sit well with Mary. So things kind of weren't brilliant between these two and things started to go from bad to worse. Mary started to feel really uneasy about this nurse and she actually told one of her friends, Laurie Gemmel, that she was really quite afraid of this man. So Laurie asked her, you know, do you think he could really hurt you? And she was like, yeah, I do. And I think he could do worse. So already this guy doesn't sound very nice. And soon after this, Mary told her friends that she had stopped by work one evening just to, you know, pick up some papers, only to find a quite disturbing discovery. So she went to her desk and things were out of place. And I don't mean like one or two things were moved a little bit. I mean like her picture frames were physically turned upside down. Things had drastically moved. It looked like somebody had intentionally done this to mess with her like they they wanted her to think that it had been done if that makes sense it wasn't like someone was just snooping and putting things back carefully like this was so intentional it's ridiculous and so she straight away thought well it's got to be him so she went over to his desk 
and there on his desk on his notepad were the words death to her which mary obviously assumed was written about her so she made a phone call to her husband mike on her way home and he could tell that she was obviously shaken about this as you would be So she got home and Mike claims that she asked him to provide her with a gun so she could carry it for self-protection and she asked him to basically go over the handling of the gun, kind of how to use it and when they were finished she told him to place the gun under her car seat, which he did. So just a few weekends after this incident, Mary met up with her friend Laurie at the clinic to give her an allergy shot. So Larry said in Unsolved Mysteries that she seemed okay when she saw her, you know, they chatted for a bit and Mary told her that she just had a few more things to do, just to type some loose ends, run some errands, she was only going to be in the clinic for another couple of hours and then she was going to go home. But later that afternoon, Laurie says that she received a disturbing and worried phone call from Mary and... You know, she said that when she was in the drugstore, she said that she saw somebody that gave her the creeps. She said, I'm just going to run across the bridge, turn off my computer, and then I'm going to leave the building straight away and go home. Now, police aren't exactly sure what happened, but in the next 12 minutes after phoning Laurie, Mary made a frantic call to 911. So Detective Wayne Cullman from the Harris County Sheriff's Department said that they're not going to be releasing the content, and they never have, um, of the phone conversation, but he says that anybody who has heard it just had their blood chilled. He said it's, quote, a very chilling and disturbing call, end quote. So the details in Mary's abduction are unclear. However, the medical examiner would reveal that she was sadly horrifically beaten and she was shot in the head. So the investigation first led detectives obviously to this male nurse in the clinic but allegedly he had left on bad terms, he kind of left the clinic after obvious failed attempts to discredit Mary it seemed. Um, So I think they said that they do have some sort of evidence that could potentially potentially link this male nurse to the crime and he does still remain a suspect um but they also have other suspicions elsewhere and i will give you one guess the husband mike of course so what was mike doing on the night that she was murdered well mike is actually in the episode of unsolved mysteries and he kind of gives his account of it and i'm gonna kind of he gives his account and then like the detective kind of I'll tell you, I'll get to it. It is really quite, I'm really not sure how to feel about him. Like, there's something about him I'm not quite sure. So anyway, Mike claims that he was at the cinema with his daughter at the time of the murder. But the detectives kind of had trouble with his alibi and started to uncover more troubling issues. So first, according to the police, Mike intentionally stonewalled the investigation through his own actions by refusing to allow his daughter to be questioned, as he wouldn't do this without an attorney, which, honestly, I don't really see that as a problem. I mean, I know that me personally, I would not let my child talk to the police without a lawyer, you know, it's not a crime to do that, it's very normal, but this Detective Coleman is just adamant that it screams guilty. Um, he said, quote, witnesses don't need attorneys, suspects generally have attorneys, end quote. Like, I get what he's saying to some degree, but at this point in the investigation, it doesn't necessarily mean he's guilty. You know, Mike says he was simply following um, instructions from, like, close friends of his, and several of those people suggested to him that he should take an attorney with him, not because he had anything to hide, but just to have somebody with him who kind of knew what was going on, knew the procedures, X, Y, Z. So, um, he, the detectives were also suspicious because he refused a polygraph test. Um, Mike says that he was on anti-anxiety medications, antidepressants, he says that he just really wasn't sure whether the polygraph could kind of 
properly compensate for all those different conditions, which again, honestly, I, I kind of get it. Like, it's not against the law to refuse a polygraph. I mean, A, they can't be used in court anyway. B, are they really that accurate? I beg to differ. Um, so if I was in his position, I would probably refuse as well, especially with those conditions. Um, like I said, sometimes it can scream guilty, but at this point in this case, not necessarily. And then we get on to the marriage, obviously. So according to his friends, Mary and Mike were apparently having problems with their marriage. And when Mike heard rumours about Mary and a close family friend, he just basically confronted them head on, asked them about it. Um, he spoke to them and they both straight out told him, you know, there's nothing going on, nothing inappropriate. And Mike says that he, quote, didn't see any betrayal in her eyes, end quote. So it's a possibility, but Mike kind of makes it seem like there really wasn't an issue. You know, I asked him about it, whatever. Um, but then he could be downplaying it to make himself look innocent. I don't know. Anyway, so then there's obviously the other question of motive, which was money. So there was a life insurance policy that would pay out $700,000 on Mary. And obviously Mike would have gotten that. So again, life insurance policies aren't always, I mean, lots of people have life insurance policies. Um, but there was, to the police at least, a lot of reasons to suspect Mike. So finally, um, and right, this is the bit that if there was any evidence that Mike was guilty, this would point to that. And this, to, up until this point, I genuinely didn't think that he had anything to do with it. And then they started talking about this piece of evidence that I'm going to tell you next. And it really makes you flip. Well, it made me flip anyway. So, finally, the police had something very interesting on Mike Morris. So, this was a call that he made to Mary's cell phone um, about two hours after Mary made that 911 call. So, this call was made by Mike. And the problem with this phone call is that it lasted for four minutes. And the phone company, you know, sent all this through. Um, it basically meant that it was a completed call. It had gone through. So who picked up that phone? Four minutes? So normally it wouldn't go through, okay? Um, it'd normally be, you know, the automated voice. Sorry, the person you are trying to call isn't available right now. So... It, Mike says that that didn't happen. He said that it didn't get through. It was just ringing. Um, it should have, but it didn't. He says that, quote, as long as the phone call was ringing, I thought there was a possibility that she would answer it. So I let it ring, end quote. Um, but if the call went unanswered, why would it show as a four minute phone call on the phone records? You know, on Mary's phone records. You know, if... Mike is telling the truth, it doesn't make sense. I mean, for starters, any normal person would not have left a phone ringing for four minutes. You know, if I call somebody and they don't pick up after like 10 rings, like I'm ending that call, see ya, not bothered. But as well, like eventually it does just cut off with that automated voice, but certainly not after four minutes. Like it never goes on for that long. So in my opinion, that's bullshit. Um, so obviously left investigators with the burning question, if Mike's account of his side is complete bullshit, um, but he did call her phone two hours after this frantic 911 call, then who picked up on the other end? And what did they talk about for a whole four minutes? So was he talking to maybe his wife's killer, which kind of comes on to a theory. I'll let that kind of settle for a little bit. Now, so in the Unsolved Mysteries episode, Mike says, quote, I had absolutely nothing to do with the arrangement of Mary's murder. It's hurtful insinuation, but I know it's absolutely untrue, end quote. Which, I mean, fair enough, but if you actually watch it, like, he just... He just doesn't sit well with me. I'm going to try and find the episode and link it in the show notes. But 
but he the whole time he's talking about Mary he doesn't shed a single tear to me it almost seems like he is purely going on this program just to kind of prove his own innocence um he it really is bizarre it really is um and you know I'm not the only one that thinks it I mean the police still haven't eliminated him as a suspect her co-workers her friends have also had their suspicions but there is the other question of the other Mary so is there a link or was it purely um a coincidence so when he was saying about the arrangement of Mary's murder so this comes to one theory that was speculated that a professional contract killer had been hired to murder the second Mary Morris perhaps her husband putting out a hit on her perhaps only speculation um, but accidentally killed the first Mary Morris by mistake So this theory was only fuelled in part by a telephone call made to a Houston newspaper. So a call had come into the Houston Chronicle between the time that the first Mary was killed and the second Mary was killed. And it was basically saying something to the effect that they got the wrong Mary Morris the first time, the hit had gone wrong. So possibly, but then this kind of backfired because... um, the oh, what was it now the the ring of the first mary morris was missing they couldn't find her wedding ring anywhere which in a case like with a hit a wedding ring or something to the effect is usually taken from the victim to then bring back to the person who put out the hit to kind of prove that they're dead and they couldn't find this ring anywhere so mm, it kind of not quite sure you know but despite speculation that the two murders may have been connected they had their doubts um detective robert tonry with the harris county sheriff's department said quote with the remoteness of the location where the victim was found as well as the effort that was taken to destroy evidence and the vehicle that would be consistent with a contract killing but with the background of the victim that doesn't seem likely end quote which I understand, but if it was her husband, it it possibly could be. Um, And one thing to mention, so this wasn't mentioned in the episode, but I kind of went down a bit of a Reddit rabbit hole again, and I I did see one, a couple people actually, mention something. Now, I'm not exactly sure how true this is, but it could be a possibility. So apparently, obviously they couldn't find any wedding rings, um... Apparently, I can't remember which Mary it was. I really can't remember which one it was, but apparently the ring showed up on the daughter's hand. And I think it was Mike, Mike, um, so Mary McGuinness, I think it was her wedding ring. Um, apparently the ring had been seen on her daughter's hand, like way after the murders, um, or soon after, I'm not quite sure, maybe a couple months. And somebody asked like, oh, where did you find that? And they were just like, oh, I don't know, like we just found it, like it just appeared. Which is weird because A, she was murdered and they couldn't find the ring. Why would she be going out to work without her ring? I don't know. Maybe, you know, it's a thing people do. Maybe. Um, But yeah, just a little bit of thought there. Not quite sure. So, you know, they still continued to search for any clues that may connect them, but came up empty and later concluded that it was purely just a coincidence. So there were no arrests in this case, nobody, um, it's still unsolved, obviously, unsolved mysteries. But the friends and family of both Marys believe that, um, that kind of that whole coincidence explanation just is too far-fetched. I mean, what are the odds that two Mary Morrises were killed in such similar manners, just days apart? Like, that is crazy to me. They look so similar. Like I said, the hair, the hairstyle, this, they do sort of look the same. And it's hard to believe that they're maybe not related. Um, even if you don't watch the episode, I'd definitely recommend like Googling pictures of them. I know the one of Mary McGuinness that they use is a younger picture of her. But when you actually look at her there's a few other ones and they do look very similar so to me i really don't know um obviously it was it was a while ago and i don't want to be pointing fingers at anybody and you know i'm not saying that husband mike did it 
but in, it could be a possibility you know you'll just have to make your own minds up about that um so yeah that does conclude today's episode thank you very much for listening um i'd like to know what you think this has been on my mind for a while i was telling my mum about it my dad you know like everyone around me and everyone seems to think like yeah the husband sounds like he was responsible you know um so what are your opinions on this i'm very interested to find out um but yeah thanks for listening uh, on this <laughs> rather crazy episode because it's just everything's up in the air at the minute but I'm glad to be back I'm glad to be talking to you all and I'm gonna stop waffling and let you get on um oh one more waffle uh, <laughs> if oh god I've not done this in so long um, if you are wanting some more true crime, don't forget to head over to the Prime for Crime TikTok page where I post small snippets of cases and I've also got the Serial Killer series which I need to do more of, I have not done that in a while. Don't forget to like, follow, share, all that jazz, maybe leave a review, that's always nice, it does help me more than you think. And that's me done, that's my waffling done. So yeah, again, thank you very much for listening and I will see you in the next episode. See you later. Thank you.